Hi, my name is Gordy Hogue, and this is Community Connection. Each of us have stories, stories that help us understand each other and help to bring our community closer together. I have been very fortunate to have met many interesting people. People who've had a positive, profound impact on our community and far beyond. People who've had incredible life experiences and fascinating stories. Community Connections is about these people and about their stories. I'm sure you'll enjoy meeting these amazing people as much as I have. Thank you. Please enjoy. Welcome to Community Connections. My name is Gordy Hogue, and I'm so delighted to have our next guest, today's guest. He's a Surrey White Rock community lifer. He is a historian, he's a musician. Uh, he's a, a famous riding guy. He's, uh, he's an actor, he's Horst Presley. He's, uh, he's been raised on vinyl and is still playing raised on vinyl. He's a classic, a student of our community. Please welcome Tom Saunders. It's a delight to have you here, buddy. Shaboom. Here, Gord. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, growing up in this community and what that's meant to you and uh, being a lifer here, going to school, walking back and forth, getting engaged, and how you became a historian and a musician and all of that? Well, Gord, I don't know. Next question. <laughs> no, well, that, that covers it. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, You're most welcome. Thank you. Um, well, I guess in some ways I, I am a true White Rocker. I was, uh, I was born at the old White Rock Hospital uh, before Peace Arch came up, and I think I was even conceived in White Rock, and I haven't <laughs> left. So I think that's that's uh, that, that's pretty much uh, got me locked in as a, a as a longtime White Rocker. It sure does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my parents were, uh, they met, they were, mom and dad were both in the Navy uh, and they met in Halifax and they moved back to Vancouver because so my dad had, was already out from here. My mom was from Quebec and they had, I guess, three of us, my sister and two of my brothers at that point. Um, they were living in Vancouver and my dad was talking to a guy at work and said, uh, I don't know if I want to be raising our family in here. So they were living just off Main, uh, Main Street. And he thought, this ain't the, ain't the place to uh, be raising a family. So he said, well, we live out in uh, White Rock. You should come out, take the train some, uh, some time and come out and visit us and have a look at it. My dad came out and uh, ended up just thinking this is, this is the place and put ten dollars down on our house that we, <laughs> which, that we still have here uh, for uh, eight thousand bucks which which isn't that much less than our taxes now <laughs> and uh moved the family out here in september 1951 and then uh had another brother come along after that and then i was the the final they, they stopped after me Gave up. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, yeah, no, it's White Rock is probably probably the best place a kid could be uh, could be raised and and live in. Had everything that you needed to keep you amused. And uh, I never, never, I don't think was a bored a day in my life as a as a kid here. You'd I know it's like summertime, you'd wake up, you'd uh, run down to the beach and you'd stay down there till lunch, come home and have something to eat, run back down, stay down there till supper time, come back, have something to eat and back down there. And it was uh, simpler times. P parents didn't really worry too much about their kids back in those days. You just headed off and uh, it was, well, one of the funny things I think of you wake up in the morning and you argue about having to spend a minute to wait to make your bed. And then you'd run down to the beach 
and you'd spend the whole rest of the day moving giant logs <laughs> off the uh, off the beach to make a, a raft or something. And uh, there's always always something to do around. Uh, I mean, just the pier alone. Uh, there was the the dolphins restaurant. We used to swim under there, swim between all the pillars, and uh, go up top there and get a get a little boat of French fries. Um, there was a jousting pole along there where usually it was the the bigger kids. I remember going and be the pier and then off to the side there'd be a, a pole and then another one joining it to the pier and kids would get up here and, and uh, fight each other and one would fall off and there's there's entertainment you're only 50 feet out on the pier by then <laughs> um, I remember like any kid the fear of falling through the cracks in the pier <laughs> falling through that tiny little space but you were very very cautious to not fall through it slivers was a were a much bigger uh hazard down there um get out there was the boat rentals near the end um where you could rent a rent kayaks uh well they weren't really like our kayaks you see now they were open and uh, paddle around for probably 50 cents for two hours. They had those little putt-putt boats. Remember we called or them? Or you'd rent the putt-putts. I was going to mention the putt-putts. <laughs> Just putt-putt, putt-putt, putt yeah, Very, <laughs> very uh, slow things. But uh, next off there, there was the tank just beyond the boat rentals. And where you'd watch everybody doing the high dives and stuff off the off the diving boards or just diving off the pier. Yeah. Um, fishing down there, fishing generally for bullheads, um, which are these little grisly uh, fish that you could never eat, but they're very easy to catch. <laughs> Were Remember those catching bullheads? Yeah, and I think we used to catch them through the cracks and then you couldn't pull them up and you have to drag them over to the side and start swinging them until they come up far enough so you could grab them. It wasn't pretty, but... No, uh, not pretty. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, that's just the pier. Uh, some of my earliest memories are probably like of the, the sea festival down there. And I don't know, I have this one vision of... Uh, or one quick little memory of the children's parade and there was a boxing match in it. There's two kids <laughs> boxing, there was a referee and four kids standing as the posts and they had ring <laughs> ropes going in. Quite elaborate for the, uh, for the kiddies parade. Hopefully they won the parade with that. I think they did, I think they did. I remember reading something later on I started entering just after that, and I actually I still got a a broken trophy from the uh, kids parade for dressing up like Jed Clampett. <laughs> My brother and I won the children's parade at the Rosemont Florist Trophy in mm. uh, in the year 1957. I think it was the year that White Rock became a city. Mm. So I was dragging my brother in his diaper, and he was the new city of White Rock coming in. <laughs> It's, has he still got the outfit? Uh, I, I'll talk to you about that again after we do the recording, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Semiamu Park is one thing that I, it really stands out as a, as a kid. Well, I mean, part of the Sea Festival, I remember a, a couple of times, probably, I don't know how many years, they used to have, while the uh, Sea Festival was on Semiamo Park, they'd have an amusement uh, ride set up there. And do you remember that? I do, yeah. Amusement rides and uh, the, uh, I guess, carnival, you throw 20 baseballs for a nickel or something and hope to, hope to win something or other. Um, Semiamo Park, well, I mean, even with, without the fair there, there was still the uh, the nasty big red iron horse <laughs> that uh, you get on and try to hold on to. My brother called it uh, 
the White Rock Dentist's Best Friend. <laughs> so appropriate, yeah. Yeah, the metal head, you could very easily slam your head into the back of the white horses. Yeah. Especially, I mean, you it, it was nice. It would it would move as very gentle uh, thing as you're on there. And then some big nasty 14-year-old would come onto the back and start fucking ripping it back up and down and the thing would go up and forward and back and up and down and kids would fly out very dangerous uh but fun but fun but we loved it uh the the merry-go-round there where we learned uh that was another thing that you get the big kids that would come and start spinning it around and we learned centrifugal force down there from from that swings great swings big tall swings and uh, where you try to get up as fast as you could and up and then jump off, which you learned was not a really good idea. <laughs> either. So we learned a lot about physics in semi Park. Park. Um, there was that, do you remember the fountain down there? I do, yeah. It was a, uh, I think it was like a big 10 inch pipe come out of the ground and had rocks cemented around it and there was like this green slime like a moss that came down all of, but it was the best tasting uh, water ever just straight out of the ground um what else some animal part well all the sports that went on there i remember sitting many cold cold days with my parents watching my brother play football down there Actually, I played football down there later on in the Pee Wees for the, the White Rock Cougars. Cougars. Yeah, I still got my trophy for most improved. <laughs> I went from here to, to, to there at improvement. So it was very dramatic. Dramatic. And across yeah. the street, there was the bowling alley in those days, too, and the, the pool the hall. Idle hour. Yeah, the, the, I never went in the, in the pool hall. That was, that was a little sort of uh, two West Side Story oh, greasers and uh, <laughs> things. I, I never made it in there, but I remember going by and sort of looking in the yeah. in the windows there. And also down that end, the Park Theater. Yeah. It was our, uh, I mean, that's where I saw all my first movies and yeah, uh, yeah everything I ever saw. I don't, I don't remember the first time I saw a movie somewhere else, but uh, <laughs> One thing I remember my brother taking me down with a couple of his friends to see Vincent Price in The Last Man on Earth. <laughs> and I'll tell you briefly the, the plot was there was some sort of nuclear explosion or a pandemic or something. Every, just about everybody in the world died except for Vincent Price. And uh, he could go out during the daytime and it was fine to roam around, but at night, all the zombies came out. Uh, at the end of the movie, I got separated from my brother. I don't know, he took off or something with his friends. And I had to go from the theater up to our place up near Five Corners. And it was probably the longest and fastest I'd ever ran in my entire <laughs> life. We were running up Victoria. Um, Victoria Avenue, and there's still a couple of old car garages that are built into the hill. Yeah. And I was totally convinced that there were sort of zombies lurking inside <laughs> the <laughs> garage. I would, I would just boot it up there. Yeah. No, I, I, I probably couldn't drive that fast from, from the park theater to home now. But. Uh, yeah. And there was the Players Club down next to it up there in those days? That, yeah, there was uh, two doors over from it. I was, that was before, uh, before I was even born. That was in like 1950 to 57 or 58 down there. And, uh, but the, and on the other side, the a and I remember that's great memories of my uh, being taken down by my brothers and sisters in their cars. And it was very much like uh, American graffiti or something. That's what I, how I remember it. 
And was, was that the Palladium that was there before the ANW? Um, the Palladium, yeah, it was the Palladium. I think after, it was the Panda. Right Panda, before, that's right. No, yeah. Or yeah, the Panda Supper Club, yeah. Yeah. Then the, uh, yeah, the A&W was built in 63. And yeah, that was just the coolest place. I'll go down and have a, have a, uh, a baby burger and a tiny little root beer. A couple of years ago, Vin Coyne gave me a tiny little A&W root beer mug from the White Rock A&W. And that's a... Yeah. yeah. Very neat. So, and your, your family was... Uh, Talk about Five Corners and the cafe and mm. all the, the time there too. It was an institution. My parents got Five Corners Cafe, uh, changed the name to the Saunders Grill uh, at the time there. And they got it in like September of 1962. And within two weeks of getting it, Hurricane Frida came through <clears throat> town and uh, uh did a lot of a lot of damage i mean we had i think our shed blew over and a lot of the shingles and stuff the fence around white rock elementary blew down um i remember super value uh at roper and and johnson there these huge plate glass windows all blown in um anyways the restaurant or the grill as we called it um were one of the few places in town that had gas for uh, for cooking so they could still keep uh, keep going except they ran out of since everybody was coming there they ran out of stuff like eggs so my dad went around uh went around the neighborhood collecting eggs from anybody <laughs> who had eggs and they'll pay you back when things get back to normal <laughs> yeah. uh, great stories yeah they had uh they had big jukebox in there i remember being <laughs> oh one of the big <laughs> one of the big disappointments of my life being given like a quarter to plug the jukebox and uh get like five songs and i go okay c1 C1, C1, <laughs> C1, and it only played C1 once. <laughs> what was C1? I'm thinking, I'm pretty sure it was Can't Buy Me Love by the Beatles. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> will be able to check. You're the expert on that no, now. They, they, they won't know. No, no. <laughs> So is that is that where you got some of your uh, interest in music and becoming a musician and uh, all of those things? Did that grow out of your childhood in some way? I don't think. So. Well, I mean, who knows? Uh, the yeah, love the love the Beatles a little. I mean, when you're six years old and a band comes along, generally you're defenseless to uh, to not like a lot of stuff. But luckily, I had. I mean, we grew up when there was all just tons of really good, good music. So yeah, and here's here's probably the uh, main factor is that everybody in our family loved music, and they all had their own records. So here I am. I had four, well, three brothers and sister, and my parents, who all had their own records. So I had. Uh, I had access to them and they were in, they all had sort of their own tastes in music, but it was usually the pop hits or uh, old rock and roll or country music. My parents were big into country music. So, um, and then I would have started getting, buying records a few years after that. But uh, I think I started, I, I was a late bloomer with, uh, playing music. I didn't start till I was about 16. And uh, a guy I knew at school, he was a guitar player. And he also uh, was left handed. I'm left handed. You sh uh, the righty should be like this. I'm like that. Um, and he started showing me guitar chords on a ukulele. 
<laughs> that I had. So I was learning sort of the first four strings until probably a few months after that. And I uh, was able to buy a cheap acoustic guitar and then just headed off after that and then started hooking up with other musicians and getting in bands and so on and so on. And you've done that for a number of years. So Raised on Vinyl, is that uh, name uh, emblematic of your growth and your growing up? Oh, def <clears throat> definitely. Um, yeah, we had stacks of, you say, you say, you look through the pile and you pick out 20 45s or albums and put them on the thing and they just pop, pop down one after the other and you were sort of a your own DJ. And uh, mostly you'd play your brother's records when they were out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> You've been playing my records. No, I'm not playing your records. <laughs> so. And? Well, I was just going to say, so that, that's, that was your first contact with music in that fashion was your, your siblings' records. And then you picked up the ukulele. And then from there, you... Uh, well, I picked up the ukulele only for, only for probably a month or so to learn some guitar chords, and then I was off. And so I took the ukulele. Well, we had ukulele in grade four, I think, and uh, it wasn't a terribly pleasurable experience. <laughs> it was pull it, right, plunk it, right, right, right. and uh, and it never really caught the same way as we played recorders for. Mm -hmm. uh, a time, and I don't think there was that too many recorder players came out of uh, <laughs> came out of elementary school. But actually, I, I took trombone uh, in grade seven for about half a, a year, and I thought ah, this didn't really get me either. But yeah, no. So <laughs> they, they started getting on the guitar. That's when everything really took off, and that's where. Uh, and back then, if you wanted to learn a song, um, I mean, like now you just Google it or pull up a YouTube thing, but uh, <laughs> I would call up uh, CFUN or CKLG and say, yeah, could you play uh, this certain song for, for Debbie and send it out from Jim? And then... <laughs> <laughs> and then you'd run and you get your cassette deck and you'd wait and okay here's a song for Debbie this is from Jim and I hold it down <laughs> and that's how I would acquire new music for the most part. <laughs> it was cheaper than uh, cheaper than buying the 45s yeah yeah they had the the old donut place up on uh, Johnson Road where they used to sell 45s and the, they, oh yeah 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 that was next to the next to the theater, wasn't it? That's or? right. Yeah, yeah. It was for the theater eventually. We had the same space there. Yeah, and we had was it uh, the across the street from that originally there was Mrs. Lloyd's and then there was a little motel. Was it the Silver? The Spruce Court Auto Lodge. Auto, that's right. Yep. So it was a next, next to the taxi stand and then the uh, uh, the Legion next to that. And the place where you, if you were delivering papers, you'd meet up at the paper shack. And they had a lot of fights at the paper shack, as I recall, where they were establishing the pecking order of people. Um, I remember my brothers, that, that's where they picked theirs up, I think, from that. I had a Colombian route. Oh, yeah. Um, that was the, the New Westminster Daily uh, that I'd pick up from a box at White Rock Elementary. And, I am so glad now that I got a paper route just because in the uh, it just got you into all, so many different uh, places and meeting so many different people and I had a, a crazy route I think I took it because uh, it was it included our place but I mean the whole my whole route was on a hill <laughs> Uh, I was from Johnson to Oxford and from Marine Drive to uh, Buena Vista and then up Oxford uh, a bit. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, all the uh, all the old shops on Marine Drive I delivered to delivered to the uh, the Ocean Beach Hotel upstairs. The the rooms up there. Oh yeah, I remember uh, going to collect one time and uh, and uh, opens the door. It's an old guy, probably younger than me now. <laughs> um, and uh, while he was getting the stuff, I was gotten I was watching Muhammad Ali fighting on the uh, oh. on his little black and white TV. And it was near Christmas time. And for a tip, he gave me this uh, Christmas cake. You know, those are these fruit cakes oh. uh, smothered in uh, in icing. And I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. I remember it was snowing outside and I went out the back door of the uh, the Ocean Beach hotel there. There was like a little walkway. I remember sitting on the walkway and I opened it up <laughs> while it was snowing and started chomping on this, this <laughs> horrible, just 99% sugar <laughs> log. Um, and get in, getting probably a quarter of the way through it and going, this is a little too sweet. <laughs> and, uh, putting it back, folding it back up in the tin foil, taking it home. For, uh, look, mom, here's here's something for the family. <laughs> How thoughtful of you! Yes, it was. Um, another thing, the uh, I delivered to the old Elm Street uh, places there. The, the the well, there was four of them. Now there's three, and one in the back. Uh, which is Helen McIntosh, who she lived there since she was a, she was a, uh, well, I think 1910. Her parents uh, built that place. <laughs> but I remember going to hot summer day and on back behind these four houses, there was a little stream, a little creek, just a tiny little trickle of a thing that ran through there. And it was a hot summer day. So I was delivering papers to the uh, uh, the surf grocery right out in, in front of there, probably right across from there. And I bought a bag of chips and a packet of Kool-Aid and then went and ate all the chips and then used the bag to dip in this little creek. <laughs> And it was a ditch, really, but a but a flowing thing. And then poured in the uh, in the Kool Aid, shook it all up, and that was that was growing up, growing up in White Rock, growing up in those yeah. days. Yeah. So how did you in uh, Shaw Cable? You've been involved with uh, a lot of cable work, and uh, you do stuff with Blue Frog Studio, and getting also. What do you think that? Uh, Going back to Raised on Vinyl and the, the connections they have with the music and then your interest in the museum and the archives and you've given a number of talks about the community and about Marine Drive and the development of that. Do you, you think uh, some of those some of those things stand out for you as significant issues in your life and certainly the way you've been able to convey those to two members of our community I've attended some of your talks and they're most intriguing and engaging. Do some of those stand out for you in meaningful ways? No. Perfect. <laughs> but if they did, what would they have been? <laughs> oh, if they did. Uh, it's just, I, I, I don't know. I've, maybe it's because White Rock's small enough and containable enough that uh, uh, you can really sink your teeth into the, the history of it. Um, and there's so many images, really just fantastic images, photos of, uh, of White Rock, I guess, because, I mean, if you grew up in Wally or Newton or Cloverdale, I'm guessing that there aren't as many scenic photographs of those places than there are White Rock, because, I mean, obviously we've got the, the whole waterfront. Um, with the pier and the rock and the beach and the trains and and uh, the hillside as a backdrop. I mean, it's a it's a a beautiful location. Um, so yeah, to me, anytime I see a a new old new old photo, if that makes sense. Um, 
it just I'm just drawn into them just because I uh, because you you know exactly where this spot is and it's like here's here's a hundred years ago and uh, I guess the other thing is that we really haven't the White Rock as a built up city really has only been around for a hundred and maybe 110 years or so. Um, and then it's got this, the, uh, the semi-ammo uh, aspect that they've been here for, I think it's, I've seen guesstimates of 4,000 years living here. So uh, it's, I was talking earlier about uh, semi-ammo park. I remember, uh, being down there and going up to the fence as a uh, as a small child at the at the uh, semi ammo bands uh, graveyard there that's still there and just just sort of staring at and just being amazed at at the uh, it just seemed very ancient to me and I was very much aware that that. We are living in a in a uh, spot that's. I mean, it didn't just come along when when we built the A and W. Um, so it was it was always. Uh, I don't know when they when you see and there, there's paintings of uh, back in. I mean, people the white settlers that came into the area, that's that's just like months ago in the whole scheme of the uh, things. And uh, so that always, that always kind of fascinated me and uh, um, just knowing, I guess your mind has to uh, take over a lot of that history because a lot of the history wasn't, wasn't recorded. But you know that uh, things were going on here for for thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. So. One of the things that it's always I felt good about is that uh, Grand Chief Bernard Charles was elected president of Samiamu High School. And I think he was the first Indigenous person that I'm aware of to be elected president of a school that was non-Indigenous. And I remember talking to Dave DeWintz was his mm. campaign manager. And it's really interesting stories uh, in terms of the contributions he's made to the community and uh, the legacy that, that he and his family has left. And that just goes back one generation or two generations. So there's so much more as we go back beyond that that we're so blessed to be part of engaging. In. And we're just catching up to that now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty darn significant and important. So again, that's uh, the multicultural nature, but it's White Rock as we grew up in White Rock. It was there. There weren't a lot of other uh, ra uh, ethnicities involved in our community. It was no. it was very 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 white, yeah. and we're, we're now seeing that growth and becoming much more pluralistic and multicultural. And and I think that uh, hopefully we're doing that well as a community. You'd hope so. Um, there's a lot more people coming into the into the community. So you're, yeah, you are seeing, uh, seeing a lot more diverse, sorry, I just kicked the camera. Um, a lot more diversity. Actually we had, a, we had, uh, I'm gonna say not that many people other, other than uh, European descent, but, uh, but a, a few, in, back in our day, and I don't even know where I'm going with this, Gord. This well, just, so just, well, well, remember the first Chinese food restaurant down in Mar the Dingaga. The Dingaga. Yeah, no, yeah. that was that was the best. I'm still in search of chow mein as, as good as uh, from Dingaga. And that's where I learned to, uh, they taught us to take a little little thing of sesame seeds and soy sauce and dip your fork in there in the soy sauce and then in the sesame seeds and yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. I still do I still do that yeah and uh, yeah I've never had chow mein like uh, like they had it there even anything close 
and we've uh, I make pretty darn good chow mein now, but it's it's not like uh, like dingo ga. I think that that and then we've we're so multicultural now and so blessed to have uh, so many different ethnicities and religions and belief systems and uh, and being able to hopefully bring that together with a common caring for for humanity within that within this community and hopefully more broadly and the more we've learned I think or the more I've learned the more I find that how similar we are mm. how we still have the same values throughout that but we express them in different ways and it's that's uh, neat to that and certainly the work you've done in, in music that brings people together in so many ways as well. Uh, yeah, although <laughs> we haven't been bringing anybody together for the last few months here. Ferg Hawk's dance just uh, was the last thing we did. So I'm, I'm blaming you, Ferg Hawk, uh, for bringing on the pandemic. Yeah, well, I think he's a good one to blame. <laughs> he is. So we're, we're getting close to to the end of our time, are there, there are some final uh, messages or thoughts that you have in terms of that stand out, uh, those things that stand out in growing up or messages you uh, want to leave and certainly your work with the museum and and uh, Blue Frog and, and uh, documentaries and the work that you've done, you've been such a great contributor to the, the history of our community and to the living moments of it. Are there some uh, messages you would like to pass on to people given that and, and the background you've had and the interest you've developed? I, I don't know. I don't know if I have any big, uh, any big lessons to, to say. I, I mean, uh, there was just so much great stuff that I thought went on when we were kids. I said earlier that uh, we were never bored there was always something to do. Mind you, back then there was a bit more space to move around and we had uh, uh, bushes to play in and build forts and uh, we had the Tarzan swing down on, oh. uh, on the Hope oh. Estate. Yeah, yeah, Hope Properties there, uh, just up from the pier. Um, so I mean, there, I don't ever remember being bored. Yeah. Um, there was just, so much to to always do and we we're and uh and we we're building stuff we we're building go-karts or bicycling everywhere um and and so much freedom to uh go, go down probably do stuff that uh, we shouldn't have been doing <laughs> like uh hopping back in the day they had the sidetrack uh, down by the museum, down by the train station, and uh, some trains could pull off the side there. And uh, as you were kids, you'd keep your eye out and then be climbing, you'd be playing on trains. I mean, that's... Uh, and crawling under them when they stopped and you'd go to the beach. Oh, yeah, yes. Um, you know where they're, um, where they're rebuilding the, along the hump right now? Yeah. The, uh, the section where there's a big sort of corrugated wall that goes up, I don't know, 25 feet. We used to play on that. If, if you got any vertigo problems, <laughs> that'll bring it out to you because there's nowhere to really, there's no place to grip. It was just, you, you can make sure that you're holding and go up to the next level. And uh, the caves we used to dig underneath the, the hump too. Mm hmm which was pretty silly to do. In fact, there were some accidents. We did lots of silly stuff, but yeah. uh, luckily we all, most of us uh, survived out of that. But uh, um, one thing I want to say was just a really good memory is uh, Christmas time in White Rock. Um, our parents would take us up to the White Rock Playhouse, the, the little theater, as they call it then, for the uh, for the Christmas pantomimes, and those I mean they're they're intended to be magic, and they they really were. Um, so I mean they were full of they were loud and bright and funny and colorful and uh, full of heroes and villains and um, just stuff that really 
freaked you out as a kid. Like I remember being, I think th when I was three and four, there was two pantos that I saw, Robinson Crusoe and Aladdin. Huh. Robinson Crusoe was the first one. And uh, they put, they got the, the heroes and they put them in a cannibal pot. <laughs> and any kid that had access to Bugs Bunny knows that a cannibal <laughs> pot is not a good, uh, good thing to up. They put them in there and then they'd throw in a bunch of carrots and celery. And we're like, oh, they'd finally be rescued. The next, uh, and I'm just, just being, oh my goodness, this is, this is a little freaky. The next year was Aladdin and they took one of the villains and put him through a ringer washer. Remember the mangle, it was, it was two, uh, two rolls and you'd push your clothes through it. Well, they pushed, went around the back and they pushed one of the, the villains through it and he came out flat through the front. I tell you, that won't mess with a four year old head. And it but you're always safe there in the uh, tucked in between your parents on either side. They're not going to come out here, are they? No, they're, you'll be fine. <laughs> you'll be fine. Well, Tom, you, you've been, uh, your, your life and the contributions you've made to this community and the ingenuity that you've provided and your fascination with almost anything and everything are mm -hmm. a, a great exemplar, exemplary way to, to live one's life, I think. so. Thank you so much for all the contributions you have made and continue to make uh, to this community. You're a real treasure for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today on Community Connections. Please tune in to our next show as more amazing people share their wonderful stories. If you haven't already, please click on the red subscribe button below, right down there, and view our updates. Feel free to leave any thoughts our comments that you may have, we're always trying to do a better job of connecting this wonderful community. Thanks again for joining, and until next time, keep connecting. Thank you.